apologize to you when you go down there. Will there be enough time? Um, uh, okay. Anyways. Madison, I'm coming down to you guys on the 16th, I believe. So I'm looking forward to coming. I don't know if you guys have an early out that day or something, but I think I'll meet up with elementary at like about one. Perfect. High school at about two. So um, anyway, we're going to share our screen here. Um, so we'll get going with that. Just one sec. Uh, okay. I have to do this. Sorry, guys. Okay, can everybody hear us? Well, I can hear you, but I think. Do you see our screen now? You're small again, so I bet I have to open you up. Okay. Okay. Yes, see this. Uh -huh. Do you see? Do you see the Camp Paradise ESU eight? Oh, okay. Oh, that's yep. yep. We got okay. it. Yep. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Truly, some of our happiest days are when we get to work with you, Paris. Um, it's always so fun to see everybody that we met over the summer or out at schools during the year, and get to reconnect a little bit. So, um, this is our first day back um, in our Zoom series for the year. So, thanks for joining us. Um, I'm Steph Lundgren, um, and I'm Tammy Cheatham, and um, you know we're here to root you on like we root our favorite team on. Um, Tammy's a, a more of a volleyball fan, probably. I am, <laughs> and I'm more of the football girl. Um, but uh, no matter the situation, right? Just like in our schools, we like to root on our teams. So you're all of our schools, and we're always here to help you anytime. So just email us at any time that you have a question or need some advice or something. Um, we don't always know the answers, but um, we can help find the answers if need be. So, uh, all right. So I'll go ahead and get started with um, part of this self-care, um, part of this will be mindfulness. And it's just simply, you know, being aware of what's happening right now at the moment. And I am totally guilty of not this because usually um, you're trying to do 10 million different things. Um, and so I have to sometimes just stop and remind myself of this. So there's just going to be three things we're going to talk about. Um, mindfulness, um, being in the moment, um, taking those different breaths, deep breaths. We've heard, you know, five deep breaths. There's going to be some things that you do for yourself, and this is mainly for yourself, but you can use these with your students as well. And for Madison, we'll just back up for a yeah. sec here and say, this summer we worked on a little bit of self-care, and that was a really popular topic that people wanted to hear more about, because we know this is a stressful uh, profession to be in, right? And, um, you know, uh, as the year goes on, sometimes it gets a little bit more stressful, and we just really need to take a minute to take care of ourselves. and. Um, Try to feel better every day so uh, we'll keep going here so when we looked at this graphic we're going to remember that resilience is in the middle um, that's what we're trying to work for so that we become resilient with our, our situations and that we're now right now focusing on the leg that says be here now and that's the habit that we want to create so that way we're um, using that to um, our benefit as well for, as our students and the white um, pieces of this are the characters that we want to develop so um, we'll see some of those things work into this different training that we've done. So we're going to talk, we're going to pop out here to a video and this is just talking about playing with mindfulness. Um, it just gives you a couple different ways. There's going to be Spider-Man breaths, dolphin breaths, alligator breaths, butterfly breaths, and then statue breaths. Um, I was always just used to taking the deep breaths. So, um, again, when you use this, these techniques is kind of just to help you focus your attention on what's happening right then and right now. Um, some stress reduction, um, a little bit of impulse control because sometimes how we react to things that happen in our classrooms and with the kids, um, sometimes it's out of impulse and we want to maybe um, 
step back a little bit and think how we result or how we react to them. Impulse. Um, impulse is we're going to talk about our impulses later. So that's perfect. Yeah. And uh, I can just see you guys doing these breaths out in the hall because you need a minute. <laughs> And somebody else walking by and say, I recognize those Alice with Ketter breaths and I match you right. with some um, Spider-Man. Right. <laughs> so again, these links are on here. That way you can always go back and look at them. So here we go. Let's watch a video. Number three. Hello, my name is Adam Leonard from People Div okay, We're going to skip ahead yeah. here. Just from three to four minutes. Self, but let's do some movements. Um, so let's start with a few Spider-Man breaths. So let's breathe in and breathe out and shoot out your webs. And how about some dolphin breaths? Breathing in. And some crocodile breath. And a few butterfly breaths. And how about a couple, I've, I've been working a few hours and I'm really stressed breath. So lift up your shoulders and tighten them. Breathe out and relax. Ah, let's do a few of this. And then see if you can just be as still as a statue. And notice as you breathe if any parts of your body are moving. even though you're trying to be still, see where the movement in your body is. Okay, thank you for playing attention with me. Is I love those. I, I think do kids too. would love those too. I think that they would really um, connect with it. Okay. I found that I was connected with the alligator breath just because you can have that relax and then you just slam down quick, so. Um, then we go to talk about just the targets, you know, some of our learning targets are just going to be that you'll be able to define mindfulness, you'll be able to describe those benefits, and that you'll be able to practice some multiple ways. So again, we're going to give you um, from now until December to practice on those breathing techniques. Okay, quiz each other around the halls or, <laughs> yeah. you know, take that class that's all amped up right. after inside recess, right? And they do some breaths to Calm down a bit. I want to see this. Yeah. Show me your spider yes. breath. Yeah. yeah, send us a video, right? <laughs> exactly. Then you can go to the next one. Okay. Then defining mindfulness. Um, there's a link right down there that will show you like there's lots of different definitions. We're just going to focus on the one that means paying attention in a particular way, um, on purpose, uh, present in the moment. And again, with our busy lives, that's sometimes very hard to do, but it's very, very necessary for us to um, be productive with our jobs and then our family time and, and with our kids. So um, there's just some different ways for them to look at that. Boy, I have a hard time with this when technology is in front of me so bad. Um, I like even, I mean, dumb stuff, like it doesn't matter if I pay attention to TV, right? But if I have my phone in front of me, I don't even hear what the TV just said. And I'm terrible in meetings. Like mm -hmm. I'm that meeting person who has, wants to have my laptop open the whole time, but I've had to force myself to shut it and put things away because I will pay attention that that um, technology before oh, you know, know the people know. right in front of me that matter yeah, yeah. <laughs> and when we react oh, to um, yeah, to okay. a situation there's two paths that we can go down um, if we do the habit um, it's usually what's familiar and that's where we can kind of become um, impulsive we right away react and it's more with our emotions and then um, sometimes um, we say things we do things that then we wish that we could take back so with mindfulness, you go down that path and it's more of the awareness, um, taking those few seconds to think before you react. Um, have compassion for people. And again, easier said than done, but it shows that the research shows that if you do practice mindfulness a little bit each day, that there, there are things that do improve with that. So 
and actually um, we're going to talk about these later too and we did not plan this <laughs> out like this we just started to see each other's presentations and we're like oh so I'm going to talk to you about habit being more like hot and mindfulness be more more like cool later and we're going to talk about kids and their impulses so it's crazy and just a little bit so you know how the brain works with the amygdala the amygdala is um, when it, it's aroused when, it, when it's detecting something. So it's the reacting to that emotion. That's, that's where you have that first initial contact. So again, it just shows that research shows too, again, if you practice mindfulness, that then there's less gray matter um, and that helps you not maybe react as fast. And with the hippocampus, it's uh, for the learning and the, and the memory part of that. And again, when you talk about um, following mindfulness, um, it creates uh, more gray matter. So that, that's kind of where we want to get. And then we have that prefrontal frontal cortex, and that helps us with um, uh, most associated with regulating those emotions. So that's the part where we want to get to really hit that, so that way it's regulating it and not so much responding. Look at this: the benefits of mindfulness, and we've kind of touched on some of these. It's really to help you focus your attention, stress reduction, um, having an open mindedness, more contentment. And there's, again, there's a worksheet down there. It's nice that you, if you just print this off and just rate how you um, see some of these situations, you know, rating in one, two, or three as one meaning, I need more of this right now in my life, or this is a relative area of strength for me. And so, maybe just look at this list and in your own head, where's, where's there one mm -hmm. that well, you would mark as a one and which right. one would you mark as a three, like a strength? Right, you? right. And then maybe you do want to pop out and just sure. show on the worksheet uh -huh. just to see if that. We'll just quick show you what that looks like. But again, you have act. Oh, oh. Yeah, yeah. sorry. Darn it. Well, okay. we will let you they click on that. To do that. Uh -huh. yeah. We'll let you go back to that later. We'll give you that um, permission. Okay. So we'll escape and present. So when you we think go. about mindfulness, it's in everything, it, even as simple as when we um, eat and drink. Um, so like I said, when you're eating, are you really thinking about eating your food or are you just guzzling it down, gobbling it down so that way you're going on to the next thing? And, um, you know, we need to think about that as teachers, right, who have our 10 minutes to eat our lunch before we have to get out to lunch duty. And <laughs> holy cow, um, some of my um, self-care habits go down while I'm at work. <laughs> right. But, I mean, how can we add some things in and work around okay. that? And when we're actually then listening to people. You know, do we really, or is your mind going in a couple of different directions? And then you're like, okay, what did they say? I have to have them repeat it or I'll just play along with what I think I think they said. <laughs> um, also, just when you're walking, outside walking, um, I like to listen to music when I walk, but sometimes I just take off and shut everything off and just listen to the sounds because sometimes I miss all that. And they, then they just put in here, you know, brushing your teeth. You know, are you really, when you're doing it, are you thinking about brushing up and down in and around? Um, so just some things like that. Or um, the next one, if you look on uh, meditating, you know, and I have to say I'm guilty. I, I don't meditate. Um, I have started kind of practicing a little bit this. My goal is to try to do it at least once a week, just to kind of shut down, sit down, think about something. So, and my version of that is I literally lay in bed every morning after my alarm goes off the first time. And as I hit snooze. And I just think through my day and set my intentions for my day and what, what am I going to do? And really it's more about my attitudes towards, towards things like, um, you know, uh, oh my gosh, this is stressful events going to happen, but how am I going to, going to approach it? Um, and usually I try to hit that with a positive attitude and things like that so that I can kind of try to set myself up for success throughout my day each day. That's just the part of the meditation. Then this is, like I said, we won't take time to listen to this, but this is just how, if you wanted to start with just meditating, stop and breathe and think, um, you can click, uh, there's that video, and then it just talks, it walks you kind of through what to think about, talks about each part of your body, just kind of controlling and making sure that you relax it, um, you know, all the way down. And we had to do it at a, at a workshop, and it really does work. I was like, I can't do this, you know, um, but I shut my eyes and I could think as everybody watching me, but you know, if you do it at your house, nobody's going to know that. So if you can get away and I just think about that. like those few minutes, like when you get home from work, like I'm always amped up, like before you have to start cooking supper and, and doing homework and bedtimes and baths and all those, you know, things that just take that few minutes and, and yeah. breathe. And even if this is where you start, you know, three minutes a day, three minutes out of your day. So mm -hmm. it'd be a, or your stuff. lunch time if you have those extra right. three minutes to swallow, <laughs> <Exactly>. right? <laughs> swallow your food. Right. Okay. 
Uh, mindful listening, and this is so important, I think, in a, any one of our jobs that we do, because it seems like people always want want our ear. Um, kids want our ear. Other adults want our ear. Um, teachers want our ear. So I think it's important to really try to start focusing on what they're actually saying. And there's just again, I linked some things in here on the um, with right here with the in the heart. A mindful listening questions. They're just really simple little questions to ask yourself. Um, and I just thought they were good. So um, just gives a little bit of information for you. And then also too, again, people are speaking to us, but are we really truly listening to their message? Or do we react quickly because we think of what they said? And I think sometimes adults listen better to other adults than we do mm -hmm. to kids. And maybe those kids are the ones who need it the most. Um, so, right. you know, we say, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh to kids as we get busy, but um, how can we really give them our time and attention? Right. And this just talks about, you know, maybe finding you and a partner, you and another para, and just asking a question, truly really listening and asking questions that deal with that and then go back, you know, just do a quick little thing. And, and sometimes can bring some humor to, to things too, I think. So. And yeah, maybe we should try this out at home with our significant others, right? <laughs> how can you really listen to me? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Okay. Uh, the, the last piece of this, we've talked about the breathing. We've talked about the listening and now it's that generating gratitude and gratitude does not have to be for the huge, big things that happen in our lives. It can be for the simple little things. Like I've just started to think, you know, I've just like, I'm so thankful in the morning that I wake up each day and then I can walk out of bed. Um, that seems so simple, but when I, I think about people that can't do that, or have been in a severe car accident. So then I have to think, oh my gosh, this, this is something I take for granted every day. So that's why I've been trying to do, wake up and think of one thing that I'm grateful for. Um, it's so, just so important. So I told you how I wake up in the morning. I might as well tell you how I go to bed at night, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I, um, at night, as I'm laying there trying to get to sleep, I actually think, for my, think through my thankfulnesses for the day. And I think um, so long and so minute to the point I just fall asleep. So, I mean... It might be, you know, uh, yeah, very thankful for the tiniest little things um, to, you know, I'm thankful for a warm, cozy bed to sleep in. I'm thankful for the people in my life or, you know, I think of each family member and what I'm thankful for in them or I'm thankful for, you know, uh, oh, last couple weeks, it was those fresh Colorado peaches <laughs> and the fact that we live close enough to have those. So just those little tiny things. And I think it just um, turns your mind into a really positive yeah. place. They say that the people that are, that practice gratitude, um, they, they do have more positive focuses on, on their day. They also talk about having a stronger immune system. So I thought that was pretty interesting. So um, like I said, I'm doing that every morning. That's one thing I'm doing and I'm going to get better about the breaths. Those are my two goals that I'm going to have until next, from now until December when, when we see you guys again. Um, and then the last one, again, I just wanted to make sure that you know, um, how can mindfulness benefit you? Um, the other educators that you work with, students that you work with, maybe parents that you have contact with that you have to talk to their kids. Um, so maybe pick out one, one of these that you're going to do, maybe either the breathing or the listening or the gratitude, and maybe you want to combine them with two. Um, again, stick post-it notes on your mirror in the morning. You know, everybody is going to get up and look in the mirror and, and get ready for the day. So maybe that's something where you just take one of these sticky notes and remind yourself, um, a little peace and quiet too at that time. So, yeah. Yeah. So um, when you want it, get back to these resources and look at these again after our meeting's over. Does anybody know where to go? I'd throw you a virtual piece of candy. <laughs> okay, our website is bit.ly slash paras of ESU8. And it's probably where you went to click on the Zoom link today too. So, um, and I have that at the end of the presentation where you can see it again. All right, so we'll keep moving, but thank you, Tammy, for helping us get healthy, stay healthy. Yeah, I'm excited. We're going to do one of these each time when we do a Zoom. I'll mm -hmm. bring in the, the self-care. So let me know if you need anything else and I can always send something out to you or come out and see you. She has some books here listed too that might be worth your read if you want to get into that. All right, and we're going to talk about impulse control. Um, and um, so, um, I mean, how many kids do you work with that have trouble with impulse control? Let's hear from somebody. Uh-huh. Okay. 
a few I can think of. All right. To me, I mean, it's like that blurting kid, that kid who hits, you know, we'll talk a little bit more about it. But I think when we think about our schools, we can all think about a kid with impulse control issues. And one thing that you guys all said in your um, surveys this summer is that you really wanted to work more with behavior strategies. So this definitely is one of them. Okay, so executive functions are something we talked to you about last year when we talked about organization, but it really is the brain's like cueing system that um, cues function in other parts of the brain. So we will quick watch this video. I hope we don't run out of time. born with the skills we need to get things done successfully, especially in this fast and complicated world. But here's the good news. The skills we need can be taught, and they form a foundation for self-regulation and help build social emotional skills. Grouped together, three of the most foundational are called executive functions. Executive functions are a set of three cognitive skills. Flexible attention, working memory, and inhibitory control. When complex things are happening around us, executive functions help us stay on task, make plans, set goals, and carry them out successfully. They act like a traffic flagger, intentionally managing and coordinating many things at once, like helping drivers and pedestrians stay safe and making sure they obey the rules of the road. Flexible attention allows us to shift our attention when necessary, directing it to the most important tasks and sustaining it while we're working on them. Flexible attention allows us to switch focus quickly from one thing to another. Working memory is the ability to remember and use important information, like driving directions. Working memory allows us to store important information so we can access it when needed. Inhibitory control is the ability to pause and think before we act. It helps us resist impulses. It keeps us on task and helps us set goals and carry them out. Executive functions help students learn and be successful in school, solving math problems, following directions, reading, playing sports, and resolving conflicts. These skills will last a lifetime and be used every day in school, at work, and at home. They're a vital part of an education that teaches the whole child. Okay, so um, executive functions are, you know, they control so much of what we do and really activate that, those other parts of the brain. But inhibitory control um, that they talked about at the end there, that's what, um, you know, helps with impulse control. Um, so basically what they say here is that these are all learned skills. Right, most of us learn a lot of this stuff just as we go through life. We don't have to have special lessons on a lot of their executive functions. But the kids that are missing that skill do need to be taught the skills. So kids who have impulse control problems, they need to be taught how to control their impulses. And we're gonna talk about a lot of different ideas um, for that, but um, we need to remember that just because you know most kids can do it by a certain age. It doesn't mean everybody can. And so we have to take it back and teach those kids, even if it's a high school kid, um, and not just get frustrated and say, you should know how to do this by now. So kids with impulse control issues are often mistaken for being careless, mean, and rude. Um, I think about kids with impulse control issues. We talked about recess a little bit ago. They're your kids who can get into trouble at recess a lot. Maybe they end up fighting, you know, yelling at other kids, losing their cool. Um, you know, for high school kids, it might be in the hallways at lunchtime, kind of those unstructured times that they get really frustrated and kind of blow their top. 
uh, for little preschool kids, I don't know if any of you work with preschoolers, but um, you know, you think about center time and things like that, that sometimes they just can't pull it together when it's not as structured. Um, but actually, you know, we, we have to get over these stereotypes of them being careless, mean, or rude, and just know they're missing that skill. So their frustration level gets so high um, because that skill isn't there. So some causes for impulsivity might be maturity, right? Every kid suffers from it at times, um, but as they grow up, they tend to grow out of that. We probably see more impulsivity in our preschool kids than we do in our high school kids just because they grow out of it. But lack of sleep is something that's creeping up to be a big problem just in society these days, um, they talk about kids having screen time way too late at night, um, or even they call it vamping, that in the middle of the night they get a text and they wake up. Um, and so lack of sleep does make us irritable, right? I, when I'm tired, I lack control of my impulses. I might snap at somebody, um, I might be crabbier, and so lack of sleep is a big deal here. We know different kids that we work with are ADHD, right? Um, so they have that hyperactivity disorder. Um, so, um, you know, they have a tougher time controlling those. And then um, executive dysfunction. So we talked about executive function. So they need, they're missing that skill and need to learn it. Actually, 75% of kids with ADHD have executive dysfunction. So we see it um, go hand in hand there. And then there's even some phobias and mood disorders. Um, think about a kid um, that has some anxiety. And if we put them into that situation that they're really anxious about, it might cause them to be impulsive. So we can see it there too. Um, so some of the behaviors you might see are things like um, being the class clown, right? They're gonna be silly and inappropriate um, to get attention. They have trouble following rules consistently. Like I said, playground, whew, sorry, afternoon dreary days getting me. Um, uh, you know, all those different rules of how to walk in the hallway, how to eat at lunch, um, how to be on a bus, um, but in class too. Um, they might be aggressive towards other kids, like hitting and kicking and biting, and we see that a lot with younger kids. They might have trouble waiting their turn in games and conversation. That's that blurtiness. Who knows a blurter in class? Who grew up with a blurter? I can think of a blurter I grew up with, right? We all, almost every class has that blurter. We have to keep them under control. Um, they might grab um, things from people or push in line. This is, you know, pushing in line, that's even high school kids. I can see them grabbing things from each other, but it's the littlest kids too, right? The same behaviors. They might overact to frustration, disappointment, mistakes, and criticism, right? So they get mad about something and they just, you know, can't control what they do, either their physical actions or what they say. I had a student once who would just holler out in a game and call his teammates names if we were playing games. Um, they um, might not understand how their words or behavior affect other people and that that hurts someone's feelings. Um, they might not understand the consequences of their actions um, or um, take more risks. These kids tend to take more risks with dating, driving, alcohol, drugs, all those things, those risky behaviors that teenagers get into. Um, they're real impulsive about it. So they don't think it through and think the consequences. And so, you know, this is something we need to work on with teenagers too. Um, so that they, you know, all those risky behaviors might be curbed a little bit. Okay, here's another video for you. We've had some videos, but um, this one really talks about the brain and what is chemically going on in the brain at the time um, of these impulses. And I just, I think brain research is fascinating in that, you know, we're so controlled by things we don't even realize are happening. So we'll, we'll watch this quickly and then talk about what it means. And this kind of really links into the things that Tammy was talking about too.
When we hear the word emotion, most of us think of love, hate, happiness, or fear. Those strong feelings we experience throughout life. Our emotions are the driving force behind many of our behaviors, helpful and unhelpful. Just where do our emotions come from? Our brain is wired to look for threats or rewards. If one is detected, the feeling region of the brain alerts us through the release of chemical messages. Emotions are the effect of these chemical messages traveling from our brain through the body. When our brain detects a potential threat, our brain releases the stress hormones adrenaline and cortisol, which prepare us for a fight or flight response. When we detect or experience something rewarding, such as someone doing something nice for you, our brain releases dopamine, oxytocin, or serotonin. These are the chemicals that make us feel good and motivate us to continue on the task or behavior. In these instances, the feeling region of the brain kicks in before the thinking part. Sometimes the reactions of the feeling brain are so strong that it dominates our behaviors and we're unable to think rationally in the moment. Our emotions hijack our brain. While many of our emotional responses happen subconsciously, our thinking can influence our emotions and sometimes this can be unhelpful. Just thinking about something threatening can trigger an emotional response. This is where we can manage our emotions with conscious thinking. Our emotions play a powerful role in the way we experience the world. Understanding and regulating our emotions through our thoughts and behaviors can help us take greater control of our brain and achieve our goals. Okay, so just like Tammy said, right, our mindfulness can help like override those chemicals in our brain and how we respond to things. And um, I think that's true with kids too. So we think about a time that we've lost our cool, right? Like I think, um, oh, yesterday I was at a class and they gave a scenario of a parent seeing the kids run out in the street and they told them not to be in the street and the parent runs out and yells at him and spanks the kid, okay? Well, that's probably that chemical reaction of the parent got scared, right? The chemical started producing and then they react in a way that maybe they didn't want to react. Um, where if they were, you know, in that cool zone, they could go out, you know, and calmly say, you need to get out of the street. But um, that hot reaction, that quick time, is necessary for survival, right? So we'll talk about that a little bit here. Um, but when, when thinking conflicts with emotion, emotion's always gonna win. So that's where we have to cool ourselves down out of the emotion at times when it's appropriate and think rationally through it. Boy, that girl who took this picture, I'm sure she's really happy that this is everywhere on the internet, isn't she? <laughs> okay, here we go. So we do have those hot um, reactions and those cool reactions. So hot is that fight or flight, like they talked about in the video. It's like in the moment, it's super emotional. It's simple. It's either, you know, flee or, or fight it out. Uh, it's stress induced and reflexive and it's super fast. We just can, can lose it and get to that hot zone. Uh, but if we keep our cool, you know, for first of all, this develops later in humans, the uh, ability to keep our cool. It's really cognitive, so we have to think, think it through. It's complex. Like, so just like Tammy was talking about, all of those different, um, all of those um, different techniques that we have, it's, it's complex, and that's why we have to think it through and be very mindful about it. Um, it's also reflective where we think about our actions and things like that. And it's slow. It's like, Ooh, I need to put the brakes on for a minute. I need to take a break and do my breathing. Um, and you know, the hot really is based on survival, right? It's, um, it's, you know, there's danger imminent. Uh, you need to tackle that right now. Um, and we need to think about the kids that live in chaos. And our kids that we teach that um, are living in those um, situations where they have to think about survival more than other kids, right? So, so fight or flight is a part of everyday life for them. 
because it's not real safe or calm, that kind of thing. Um, we have to really get to those kids and teach them what it's like to get cool and to think through because maybe they're having to rely on that hot zone a little bit more. All right, so our big tip for this is that we need to uh, cool the now and heat the later. So for kids in our class, that's the big trick, right? So I don't know if you can see this or if this is in the way for you guys to. Um, but um, so typically got uh, kids, they want what they want right away, right? Especially impulsivity kids. Um, it was the picture of the jelly beans versus the apple, right? They want it right now. I want that jelly bean right now. I want dessert first. Um, but as, as teachers, we have to, to um, show them that right now we can cool that need off, but we can heat it up for what, why you would want it later. So let's talk a little bit about um, this. Um, hold on, let me get to my notes here. Um, we have a quote out of a great um, article I read online and the link is at the bottom if you wanna read the whole article. But it says, the critical thing is to make delayed consequences more visible, more complete, more consequential, and to make the immediate rewards less hot. When kids are stressed out, it's much more difficult for them to keep long-term goals in mind because they are constantly activating their hot or stress-induced system. So, um, you know, they gave some ideas um, in this article too, and it made me really think about um, kids with their phones, right? I was at a school last week where um, phones are not allowed out for high school kids anymore, or junior high kids and high school kids. Um, they have to keep them in their locker all day. And actually, the kids were saying positive things about it, right? That surprised me because I don't know that I'd say the positive things about it. I'm so reliant on my phone. But so if a kid decides that texting is a distraction for me, right? Texting is that hot thing that I want to have in my hands and I want that, you know, instant reply to my friends or whatever. Um, for the kid to be able to rationalize and say, that is distracting me. I'm going to go ahead and turn my phone off while I do my homework um, uh, and put it away because I have this big thing at the end. And maybe they have a picture of um, like a football player because when they get their homework done and they get good grades, then they're eligible to play football, right? So when we can make it really visible that, hey, this this good thing is at the end. And if we wait for it, we're eligible and we get the good thing. Does that make sense? And the author of this article also talked about when he was quitting smoking. And actually what got him to quit um, was that um, he saw a, a friend in the hospital dying of cancer. And um, if he needed a reminder of why he needed to quit, he just looked at a picture of his friend. Okay, so right away there was that instant need to have another cigarette, right? But the picture reminded him that I can delay this. I don't need that. I need to live. So when we can do that for kids, all the better. And we'll talk a little bit more about that through intervention ideas. So when we have a kid we know is struggling, like how do we decide what to do for that kid? So one thing is reframing their thoughts and affirmations. So um, kind of like Tammy was talking about, we need to get real positive in our thoughts, right? So um, I can think of a kid that I used to work with years ago at a children's home and every other kid was always picking on him and he'd lose his cool and he'd just blow up, right? So I tried to work with him on reframing thoughts um, to what are the good things that are happening? What good things did you do? you know, like even to see the situation objectively and to say positive things to themselves. Like every time you get in this situation, what could you say to yourself? Or um, before class, when this situation is hard for you, like talking about a kid who blurts, maybe for instance, say, I can wait my turn before I talk, you know, I can wait until my teacher calls on me before I talk in class today. 
And if they just kind of repeat that mantra in their head, I mean, it might take them saying it 60 times a day, you know, um, all the better. I can wait um, until it's my turn to talk. I can wait until it's my turn to talk. And, you know, as simple as that seems and kind of elementary, even some older kids need that reminder so we can re reframe their thoughts. Um, and then we can give behavior prompts. Like we could give them some scenarios of behavior situations. Um, uh, maybe if um, they're very impulsive during uh, music class. I had students that I'd send to music class and they would talk incessantly and they would bug all the kids around them. They'd pester them, they'd touch, they'd, you know, move their feet against them and things like that to bug kids, just couldn't control those impulses. So we could talk through the scenario. And talking through that scenario, we also talk about like the social aspects of it. So not only are you making your music teacher happy and you're learning more because you're paying attention, but also who, are you gonna have more friends? Um, are the people gonna um, wanna be around you more often? And so they might actually illustrate some of their own pictures and draw them. Um, and then we always want to give examples and non-examples. Like, what does this look like? What does it not look like? And really focus more on the examples, but those non-examples um, help out to um, give that contrast. And then, you know what? They're going to come up with some behavior situations that you didn't even think about. Maybe it's happening when you're not right around it. And then social stories. Have any of you guys used social stories with kids before? You know about those? Counselors use them with a lot of kids. I've, I've never used it personally, no. Okay, so um, they're almost like, I mean, if you think about like a story, like a comic book story in frames, and they show the steps to take through a situation. And then um, kids can have that like in a folder or something. And before that situation is about to happen, um, they can look through it again and read through the little, you know, captions or whatever to know what to do in a situation. And it might seem basic to us because we have those skills, but for the kids, um, it's really helpful. So, um, okay, so say there's an assembly at school, right? And we're going to have to go to an assembly. So it might show I walk in the halls with my hands at my sides quietly. Um, I sit down in the gym um, and only talk to my neighbor, I, you know, or something like that. You know what I mean? And it takes them through every step of it. I, I clap politely without screaming out at the end. Um, and um, yeah, those kids get impulsive at assembly, don't they? But um, so those are a few little things um, that you can do with kids to help start to be aware, number one, that they're being so impulsive. I think some kids don't even realize it but also um, to think through the situation before it happens. And there's a few more interventions here, like teach uh, waiting to be called on. And I, I guess I was a pretty strict teacher. I, um, in my classroom, I just had to maintain kind of some order. And um, that was one thing that we just didn't do. Like it wasn't a blurty situation. And the times that I got kids that were those blurty kids, you know, sometimes if you even um, track it for them and you as a para might be able to like on the sly have a little piece of paper and mark like with tallies how many times they blurted in a 15 minute class or something like that. Sometimes it's just a wake up call to them of, oh my gosh. And then you say, hey, what's this doing to all the other kids? Are they getting their turn in? Um, so some things like that, um, you can teach that waiting to be called on. And, and also, I just would ignore. If they want to blurt, I'm going to ignore what they say, and I'm going to only talk to the person that I call on or something like that. Um, there's self-monitoring things like there's even little charts um, that you can um, maybe chart every 10 minutes where you, um, you know, being impulsive or not. But the important part there is that you give them feedback. So if they're doing a really good job, you go over and you talk about what you saw. Hey, I saw you raise your hand three times and wait for the teacher to call on you. Um, without the feedback, it's just kind of useless. Um, they want that feedback from you and that praise to know that they're doing the right thing.
or maybe that they're doing something they need to work on. Um, and then always establish those routines and accountability. Um, I think about this too, the routines that you have, maybe if you pull a small group, like at reading time or something like that, to really um, have those routines in place and know we're gonna follow these rules every time because that's what's best for you and for learning, you know? Um, and then that if then chart for kids, especially those ones that are having social problems, I think we can get that in like, um, if we don't blurt, um, then everybody gets a turn um, and everybody gets to learn to their fullest. Um, if I don't blurt, I make more friends because they feel respected, you know, that kind of thing. So you can do a little chart like that. Any other things that you're doing with kids that have a hard time with impulse control? You guys are the experts in the field. I guess I, if I have a student that's uh, doing that, I tend to take them out of the room a lot of times. Sure. And we have a little chit chat back and forth about, you know, what's going on, why are you behaving this way? And then we talk about how, when we go back into the classroom, what do we need to do or how do we need to act? And they, they tell me right back most of the time how to react and we go back in and, and they're us usually better. Yeah. You know, I even think paired with that is like, um, have them help you think of a little cheat sheet to put inside their desk. You know, you could tape it to the side of their desk or tape it inside of a folder for an older kid and just have like um, maybe three little tricks, you know, that they want to, that they could glance at um, when they're having trouble. They could just um, calm down and, and glance at that. I think Tammy's breathing too would be perfect here for those kids. If they had to step out of the hall for a minute, not, you know, I used to tell my kids, oh my gosh, you're up here. Let's cool it down. Um, and those breathing techniques would be awesome there. And that's what I was thinking too. Some of these students that we have here anywhere in Stewart, that would be a good thing that we could probably do is pull them out, have them do that breathing and, and before we pull them back in. Yeah. Yeah. I think that would fit in with a lot of your executive function work at Stewart but everywhere too, right? All right, so basically when we help kids like um, with these impulse control problems, um, well, first of all, we make our lives easier, right? Um, but we make a difference in their lives, um, and, you know, their day-to-day -day lives, their self-esteem, and really their future because we want to get these um, behaviors in check while they're still a kid in our schools and not when they're adults being super impulsive on a job and maybe not being able to keep a job. So um, our paratraining series will continue in December. We're gonna talk about um, kids who have lived through trauma. Um, uh, so different emotional traumas and what effect that has on their whole life and how we can teach them and um, help intervene to, um, you know, to get to the root of some problems. February, we're going to look at science. And so with science have new standards from the state and it's supposed to be taught in a very different way now where we're kind of hands off. So what does it look like to be a para in a science classroom now um, that the standards have changed? And in April, we're going to um, learn some info on autism. So autism is something we see in a lot of our students today. So we'll look at that. But in between time, uh, Tammy and I are always here, and we just want to thank you, number one, for the job that you guys do every day, helping teachers and helping kids, and schools could not function without Paris. So good job. Keep up the good fight, right? And if you need anything at all, email us. But here's that link, again, to our website. So the website is going to have this presentation. Um, and it'll also have a recording of our meeting. So um, sometimes people can't attend live. Maybe there's a parent at your school who wasn't able to attend live but wants to watch it later. They'll be able to access that um, on that link. So you'll just click on September resources. Okay, and then I did have a couple more resources. Um, this is an article from that Mind Shift, and then there's an article from Understood 
And these are two of my favorite educational resources anyway. Um, so you can play around on the sites a little bit too and um, see some other great stuff. Anything left for the good of the group before we head out? Everybody's so quiet. Okay, hey, thanks guys. We'll Thank see you, you in December. Thank okay. you. Okay, take care. Um, Madison, I'll see you in a couple weeks. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. 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 Raspberry, right? No, I don't know. How do I get out of here?